Hello, my name is Dr. Ben Segal, and I am the Chair of Neurology and Director of the Neuroscience Research Institute at The Ohio State University. I'm also a practicing neurologist and researcher with a subspecialty in multiple sclerosis and related disorders. You know, one of the most gratifying components of my career has been to participate in and witness the tremendous strides that have been made in the treatment of multiple sclerosis. When I was a doctor, doctor in training, we had no drugs that altered the course of the disease. We would treat patients with steroids during MS exacerbations to accelerate recovery, but we had no drugs that, that ensured a better um, long-term outcome for our patients. Now there are over 15 drugs approved by the FDA that significantly decrease the rate of MS relapses or exacerbations. In addition, two of these um, drugs, or actually now three of these drugs, also is approved to help slow the progression of disability in patients who have progressive forms of MS. So it's a completely different world now for people with MS. And when patients come to our clinic and they're diagnosed quickly and put on the right medication, they, we expect that they're gonna live in most cases a full active life. So the question arises with all these different drugs, how does one decide which one to take? Well, this is a complicated uh, um, process between the patient and the doctor. Um, we have to weigh the risks and benefits of each agent and how they align with the needs and goals of each individual person with MS. So these drugs do have side effects. Some of them can increase the, the risk of certain infections. Um, some of this, these infections are serious, and though um, it's rare to get one, we have to be prepared and, and decide um, if a patient is more or less susceptible um, to a particular uh, side effect, including infection. And also, these drugs differ in how potent they are in suppressing relapses. So some people have more active disease than others and may choose to go on a more highly efficacious drug. There are also lifestyle considerations. Um, some of the drugs are given by an infusion and you have to come to um, an infusion center uh, sometimes every month, sometimes every six months, um, sometimes five days um, in the course of a year. Um, other drugs are given by subcutaneous injection and others are pills. So this is a complicated formulation. And at the Ohio State University, our MS specialists do go over the possible medications with a patient, but also we have a specially trained pharmacist who could meet with patients one-on-one -on -one separately to um, go into the different details of the drug's efficacy or effectiveness and the different uh, potential adverse effects in detail so that um, uh, our patients are as well informed as possible in making their decisions. In addition to trying to alter the disease course, MS causes a whole array of different symptoms. Uh, fatigue is very common in MS. Some patients have spasms and muscle stiffness, weakness, altered gait, some have balance issues, um, um, mood swings are, are common in MS. And so we endorse a customized approach in taking account of the patient as a human being and collaborating with other experts in order to address each patient's individual symptoms. We have a quality of life clinic um, in which patients could discuss all of their challenges, all of their concerns, and then a plan is set up and we have uh, MS specialty focused physical therapists, speech therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, urologists, sleep and fatigue specialists. 
all of us come together to treat the patient as um, an individual. So, um, you, you know, there have been new drugs that have been approved as recently as uh, 2020 and 2021. Um, there are so many different options. But the good news is that these drugs do work in the majority of individuals. It is important to uh, be under the care, in my opinion, of an MS specialty team to monitor each patient's progress and how they respond to the drug. And if the occasion arises that, um, uh, uh, that it, it's necessary to switch from one drug to another, um, the team recognizes that and then can uh, help the patient address uh, that issue as well. Um, so, you know, uh, a big component of what we do at The Ohio State University is also research. And we have a number of studies ongoing. Some studies are to check the efficacy of the COVID-19 in people with MS, whether or not they're on a drug that may suppress the immune system. We also have upcoming clinical trials of new agents. Um, one uh, of these trials deals with a drug called the Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitor, or BTKI, that potentially could not only suppress MS relapses, but may be effective in slowing the accumulation of disability in patients with progressive MS. So we're excited about um, this trial because both there's, there's um, sub-trials, one of which will be for people with relapsing disease, another for patients with progressive disease. And there's more on the horizon. One of our big goals is to develop uh, therapies that actually reverse damage that regenerate broken nerve fibers and stimulate new myelin sheath formation. We and other universities are working in animal models and we have candidate drugs that um, hopefully, hopefully will be brought to uh, clinical trials in the coming years. Um, at this point, um, I'd be happy to address any questions that have been submitted um, by people watching this this video. Yeah, so our first question is, um, is the COVID-19 vaccine safe for people with MS? Is there any concerns that people should have um, prior to getting the vaccine if they haven't gotten it already? Well, we encourage people with MS to get the vaccine. And thus far, um, there are many registries around the world that are monitoring the effects of the vaccine in people with MS, and no uh, red flags have been raised. Um, I'm on a panel that advises the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, and the National Multiple Sclerosis Society as well has endorsed um, the COVID-19 vaccine for people with MS. Now, the vaccine can cause uh, temporary um, side effects like a sore arm. Some people get fevers and, 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 um, and uh, muscle aches. Um, however, those symptoms do ebb um, uh, over time. Um, and we think it's very important that people be protected from the COVID-19 infection, particularly if they have MS. There's a lot of data indicating that when people with MS get infections, they're more likely to have a relapse. And there's very recent data indicating that that is true um, for COVID-19 infection as well. So weighing the risks and the benefits, um, once again, I strongly encourage people with MS to get the vaccine. Uh, we have another question. What is the prevalence of MS in the general population? So the prevalence of MS is approximately 0.1 to 0.3%. So that means that about one in a thousand to three in a thousand people, this is in the United States and in Europe, um, uh, um, have multiple sclerosis. It turns out that some recent studies indicate that the incidence of MS may be increasing, though, um, throughout the world. And in particular, 
in the United States among um, African Americans and Hispanic Americans. Um, the latest epidemiological studies indicate that close to a million people in the United States are now living with multiple sclerosis. The prevalence does vary though based on location and particularly where someone has lived during childhood. So the, the highest prevalence areas are far from the equator. Um, Canada, um, the United States, particularly the northern United States, uh, Scandinavia, Scotland, etc. are places where MS is most common. It's least common in countries close to the equator, but it can occur um, anywhere in the world. So with that in mind, are there risk factors or things that people can be doing actively to prevent MS? What is um, sort of the things that maybe are leading people to get this? Are there things people can do preventatively or not so much? Well, um, so MS is a complicated disease and there are genes you inherit that increase your risk of getting MS. There are also environmental factors. So over 200 genes have been identified, each of which contributes a little bit towards your susceptibility to MS. And the first degree relatives of people with MS um, develop MS at a rate of about um, uh, four, two to four percent, which is higher than in the general population where it's 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 percent. So there are some genes that, that, that predispose, and it's the constellation or the array of genes that you inherit that make the difference. But there's also definitely environmental factors, and the, the three environmental factors that um, have been identified most strongly with risk of MS is, uh, include low vitamin D levels, um, low sunlight exposure, particularly during childhood, um, which relates to vitamin D because sunlight catalyzes the active form of vitamin D, and also exposure to Epstein-Barr virus as an adult. So Epstein-Barr virus um, causes infectious mononucleosis. Most, most of us have been exposed to Epstein-Barr virus as children or as teenagers, but um, a small percentage of the population have not been exposed based on blood testing. If they do become infected with Epstein-Barr virus in adulthood, that also seems to increase your risk of MS. Um, we also know that cigarette smoking worsens the course of MS and also might increase the risk of MS. So, um, you know, I encourage particularly first degree relatives of my patients with MS to take vitamin D3 supplements to get some sunlight exposure, though once again, you have to weigh that against the negative effects of sunlight, like risk of um, skin cancer, et cetera. So you should use um, uh, sun, you know, sunscreen protection. Um, and also to live a, a healthy lifestyle and um, to quit smoking if you're smoking and not to start smoking if you've never smoked before. Also, there's a lot of data that regular exercise and also stretching, for example, yoga is beneficial in multiple sclerosis. We don't know if remaining uh, or maintaining an exercise schedule and being fit decreases your risk of MS, but if you do develop uh, MS, it definitely leads to um, a higher degree of function and well-being. So we have several people who are commenting that they've been diagnosed recently, um, and obviously we you know, want folks to speak with their doctor directly about any specific questions they might have, but could you maybe talk a bit about after diagnosis, what are sort of the next steps that someone should be taking with their doctor in general in terms of you know, any lifestyle changes, or what does that process look like as now that you've been diagnosed, what steps are taken next? So um, one very important decision that needs to be made is whether you should start what we call a disease-modifying therapy. And that's a drug that could decrease the risk of future MS relapses or attacks, and in some cases may slow down the uh, disability that some patients experience slowly over time. 
So you should talk to your, your provider about whether or not you're a candidate for one of those drugs. And then um, if you are, you have to decide which of, of the many drugs we now have is best for you. And as I mentioned earlier, at the Ohio State University, all the MS specialists are very um, up to date on um, the, the clinical trials and the side effect profiles and all the uh, reports of uh, adverse effects um, of these different drugs. And we, of course, discuss that with patients at length. But we also encourage patients to meet with our MS-focused pharmacist who could go over the drugs in detail. If you do start one of these drugs, in some cases, you need to have blood work done uh, uh, and other testing, um, some, some visual testing in some cases with a, um, uh, uh, an ophthalmologist. Um, you may need an EKG before you start that drug. And sometimes we recommend getting certain vaccines to provide extra protection from particular infections depending on, um, on the drug that you start. Um, the other thing to discuss is what symptoms you're experiencing from MS and, and how they can be alleviated. So once again, patients experience pain. Fatigue is actually the most common symptom of MS. And sometimes that is associated with a sleep disorder that's treatable. Um, some people have cognitive issues. Um, it, it's not uncommon to have um, a, a degree of depression, anxiety, difficulty adjusting to your diagnosis, and you may benefit from uh, talk therapy or um, other interventions to, to help with that. Um, patients also may have balance problems. They may be weak, um, swallowing difficulties, speaking difficulties. All of these symptoms you should feel free to discuss with your provider. And um, we have a whole team of, of collaborators, therapists, other subspecialists to um, uh, put together a, a comprehensive plan that, that, that treats each individual as um, uh, a unique person. So um, also bladder symptoms are quite common, urinary urgency, hesitancy. Some people have sexual dysfunction. I encourage patients to, um, to discuss any uh, symptoms they're having. Um, if you don't discuss them, they can't be addressed. And then in terms of general lifestyle, I encourage all MS patients, whether or not they have a, a permanent uh, disability or, or are, are in the midst of a relapse and might recover, to engage in some form of exercise. That should be discussed as well. And um, I mentioned other lifestyle changes, diet, a healthy, well-rounded diet is important. Um, we talked about vitamin D supplements, et cetera, and so forth. And that's all the questions that we have for now. Okay.